just got louder, fabulous. I'm going to talk about uh, Secrets of Growing an Innovation Culture, uh, which is a bit of a ridiculous title, but this talk was essentially sparked off by a conversation I had with a senior architect type person at a large company that you've probably all heard of. And uh, this guy pinged me because he wanted to hire the next John Allspore. So for those of you who don't know, John Allspore's the head of ops at Etsy, fabulous, brilliant guy. And he said, you know, we want to hire someone like, like this. Um, and my, my initial thought was, the fact that you have to go outside of your company to try and hire someone like this demonstrates that you failed as a company to actually be able to grow these people internally. The next person like that should be coming from within your com company. And if that's not true, you failed as leaders because part of the job of leadership is to be able to grow the capability of the people within the organization. So I'm always profoundly depressed by LinkedIn, all these people trying to hire. Uh, it's, you know, it's all about trying to hire in talent. And I, I think that, that, that demonstrates that we're doing things wrong because we shouldn't need to always be hiring in senior people. We should be growing those people. So how do we do that? Well, this talk is just a number of thoughts and things that I've put together and, and read about um, in the course of my research on how we actually do this. So I don't have the answers. I just have some thoughts. And the purpose of this talk is to hopefully spark some thoughts and discussions and ideas on how to improve the culture of our organizations um, generally. So, we often think that our job is to build systems and products, but that's only one part of what we do. Our work has two outcomes. Firstly, it has the outcome of the systems and the products we build, but it also is creating knowledge. I mean, we, we always talk about IT as knowledge work, but normally, we talk about knowledge work in, ter in terms of, kind of in this transactional way, as consuming the knowledge of the, the people doing the work. Um, so the, the, the kind of model at, that's at play in terms of knowledge work uh, is twofold. Firstly, there's kind of the bank account model of learning. So um, there was a book called um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed that came out in the 70s in Brazil um, by an educator who basically criticized the dominant uh, educational paradigm, which was that we treat children in our education system as empty bank accounts who we aim to fill up with knowledge. We kind of pour the knowledge into their heads and they're passive receptors of knowledge. And what he noted in this book is that when we teach in this way, what we basically are doing is trying to create a system where we preserve existing social structures and social power and, and, and control by the elite. And real education happens when the people who are learning participate in how they learn and are responsible for helping decide how they learn and what they learn. And so if our education system follows a bank account model of filling our empty young children's minds up with knowledge which is decided by the people in power, then a lot of our companies behave as if we have filled up bank accounts that we're draining of knowledge in the service of profits and uh, of, of building products. And so I think we've kind of lost, I mean, when we talk about you know, a knowledge culture, we need to think differently about that. The job of companies is to help grow knowledge and grow the capabilities of people, not just to suck knowledge out of the heads of employees. How do we... How do we innovate? I mean, there's this, this word innovation. One of the things about innovation is that when we innovate, we cannot know in advance what we're going to produce. Because if we knew in advance what we were going to produce, it wouldn't be innovation. And this is a, this is a really important point when it comes to thinking about how we actually plan innovation. If you could plan what you were going to produce as the end products completely in advance, it wouldn't be innovation. And this is one of the reasons that I think that there's a, a serious problem in a lot of even agile development methodologies where the first part of the process is breaking everything down into small little bits and then feeding those small little bits, you know, stories or tasks or requirements, you know, into the development kind of process and then assembling the results out the other end. Because if we're doing that, we're not innovating. I mean, innovation isn't just in the you know, breaking down of little bits and pieces. We innovate in the course of actually doing our work. If we don't discover new things in the course of building products, we're not innovating. Um, so 
Innovation comes from the people doing the work, experimenting and improvising and trying things out. And in as much as our development process doesn't allow people to experiment and try things out and feed back into the process of what we're building and actually cause us to change what we're building in reaction to what we discover in the process of building it, we can't innovate. True innovation comes from people being able to experiment and improvise and tinker as we build things, not by creating a process and planning out in advance what we're doing. Innovation culture requires that uh, well, I mean, first of all, in order to be able to experiment, it needs to be safe to fail. So most experiments in an innovation context will demonstrate that our hypothesis was wrong. Again, that's one of the hallmarks of innovation is the ideas that we have. Many of them will turn out not to be good. And so if it's not safe for those experiments to fail uh, and we punish people for getting things wrong instead, then we can't innovate. And that's one of the biggest problems in large co corporations is that people are punished for getting things wrong and it's not safe to get things wrong. And in that situation, that's what causes people becoming passive and not wanting to try out new things because they know if they try out new things and it goes wrong, management's going to slam down on them and tell them, you, you, you messed it up, don't do that again, follow the process. Another problem um, with innovation at scale is that a lot of organizations try and implement innovation in the form of a, a change program or some other uh, kind of transactional mechanism. And all of these mechanisms have an end date. The one thing you can say about truly innovative organizations is that in organizations which really sustainably innovate and have managed to sustain innovation over decades, the improvement never stops. Anytime you see an innovation effort or an organizational change effort with an end date, you know that there's no real desire to actually create a true capability for innovation within the company. And then the other thing we need to think about is actually, to some extent, measuring how well we do at that. So who has a review process in their company? You, know, you have an annual review or some kind of review. Okay, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Put your hands down if there's no focus at all on the kind of amount of knowledge that's been created or how well we've done at growing the people who work with us as part of that review process. So you can keep your hands up if that's actually something that people care about. How well have we done at growing knowledge, at growing the capability of the people we work with? Okay, so a few of you, that's really good. That's really important. The job of leaders and, and managers is to grow the capability of the people under them and kind of make themselves replaceable. And uh, what we notice about high-performance companies is they're really good about talking about, about what they do, about blogging what they do, about you know, simple things like having lunch and learns um, and mentoring people and helping people out. That's a really important characteristic of high-performance companies is that there's a focus on trying to measure and improve how well we do at cultivating knowledge and capability within our organizations. So things that are not very effective, classroom training is a very poor way of actually creating, uh, of actually changing things. And, you know, I actually make money out of doing classroom training. Um, and, you know, so there's a, I'm kind of conflicted about this because there's a high demand for training. But my, my observation is that classroom training in and of itself doesn't create change. Uh, you know, I was talking to Jason Yip about this the other day, and you know, he made the point that the best that you can hope for in training is to you know, spark someone having an epiphany or an idea which may lead to change. Um, but you, know, you go through training, you, you, people in a day or two days cannot hope to develop a real hab habitual understanding of, of what you learn in that day. Um, Buying tools is a really horrible way of, of changing your organization, and it's very, very common. I mean, my company builds tools, uh, including project management tools, and often the people who are our customers, they want to go agile, and so they want to buy an agile tool so they can go agile, and that's one of the first things they do. And then what happens quite often is that they come back about a month later and say, so we've noticed there's no way of measuring the time that everyone spends on these things and being able to track that. And we say, well, no, because that's actually a really bad thing to do. Uh, and they say, no, 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 but that's our process. And we kind of say, well, actually, maybe part of the change effort is that you want to change your process as well. And they say, no, 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 we want to keep our process and have a tool that conforms to that. And then there's never any change. So you know, people always jump to buying tools. Uh, it's very common. Buying a tool and implementing a tool has 
is, is neither necessary nor sufficient um, for organizational change and improvement. Uh, adopting methodologies is another very common way, you know, adopting Scrum or having program-based approaches to change, again, with end dates are very common, but again, not very effective. And I'll explain why adopting methodologies is problematic a bit later on. But we see so many people say, oh, we tried Scrum and it failed, or we tried Agile and it failed. Um, and the essence of Agile is not the things that you do. The essence of Agile is constantly adapting and improving. Uh, and so we... You know, obviously, if you take something and you try and implement it as is, um, it, it, it's, that's one step, and that's going to produce one outcome, but the, the goal is to produce a continual improvement in our ability to change our outcomes in response to signals from our environment. And then finally, hiring people. Um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of organizations try hiring people in order to grow their capability, and that's, that can be part of a change effort, but it's not going to fix things on its own. If you take a messed up organization and hire really great people into that organization, what's going to happen is not that the organization is going to change, but it's going to break the people and make life really unpleasant for the people, and they'll probably quit. Um, it, it, you, you can't just hire people in and expect that to change an organization in its own right. A big problem we have in our industry is that growth tends to kill innovation. Startups are well known for being kind of the hotbed of innovation, and then what happens is startups, if they're successful, grow and become bigger. And we see a number of forces at work. Firstly, as organizations grow, they, the, the, the business domain they work in becomes more and more complex, and the systems they build become more and more complex. Education as well, I think. So, the improvement cutter is basically an iterative process for moving towards a goal in a complex system. Step one is for us to understand the direction in which we want to move. Where do we want to go? What are we trying to achieve? And then the next step is for us to grasp the current condition. What's the current situation right now? Step three is to establish the next target condition. Where do we want to be in about a month, you know, two to six weeks? And then, once we've set the target condition, the people doing the work will run experiments to try and achieve those outcomes. Because we're innovating. We're operating in conditions of uncertainty. We're working in complex systems. We don't know how to achieve those outcomes. The only way we can find out how to achieve those outcomes is to run experiments and learn. The problem with... I mean, everybody believes in continuous improvement. You'll never go to an organization and they'll say, oh, we don't believe in continuous improvement. It's one of these things that everyone says they do. But continuous is one of these words that means a lot more often than you think. If continuous improvement at your organization is having a retrospective every month, that's not good enough. Continuous improvement every month is unacceptable. One of the things that Mike Rother says is that these experiments should be occurring every day. Every day, we should come into work and ask ourselves, What's the target condition? What's the actual condition now? What obstacles are preventing you from reaching that target condition? And which one of those things are you addressing now? And then, what's your next step? What experiment are you going to run? So PDCA is called the Deming Cycle, Plan, Do, Check, Act, and it's basically a statement of the scientific method. We come up with an idea for an experiment, we plan, um, we run the experiment, we do, we check, we look at the results of the experiment and compare them to what our expectations were, and then we act based on what we find. And that may, in most cases, lead to another cycle of plan, do, check, out. So what experiments are we going to run to try and move towards the target condition that we're addressing right now? And then, when can we go and see what we learn from taking that step? And so the improvement cutter is something which is iterative. We go through this loop of uh, stages two, three, and four, um, pretty much every two to six weeks. Uh, and so, so it's, it's iterative in the, same way that, in the same way that Scrum or whatever is iterative. We have these one-month sprints. You can do this in monthly uh, kind of iterations if you want. Grasp the current condition. Establish the next target condition as a team. Where do we want to be a month from now? And then don't plan how you're going to do that. Instead, the people doing the work work out how to achieve those. Now, those target conditions, they could be in the improvement cutter, as written here, those are process target conditions. It's how we want the process to look. Instead of getting good builds once a day, 
we want to be able to get good builds 10 times a day. Instead of it taking us a week to fix um, critical defects, we want to be able to fix critical defects within a day. Those are examples of target conditions you might have at the process level. This can also be used for product development. What are the user behaviors we want to change? What, maybe people, we're getting a conversion rate of 2% now for our products, and we want a conversion rate of 5%. Instead of writing down you know, epics and breaking them up into stories and tasks and giving them out to people, instead of doing that, a great way to run a program at scale is for the leadership to state the target outcome they want to achieve in the next iteration. And then rather than telling people how to achieve that, let the people doing the work run experiments to try and work it out for themselves. And that's the in input to you know, a hypothesis-driven delivery type process where we specify a hypothesis and then you know, run an experiment to try and actually achieve that, which is what I was talking about in my talk yesterday. And then the other thing to bear in mind is that as a result of doing this, we may realize that the target conditions were the wrong target conditions. If the target conditions produce the wrong behavior and within the organization, then that might have been the wrong target condition to set. And so we're constantly evolving our target conditions in response to what happens in the iteration. And this is called double loop learning. Um, and it's the idea that we change our goals in response to what we discover in pursuing those goals. And then that will cause us to update the direction periodically as well. So I want to give you an example of an organization which followed this, um, Hewlett Packard. So some of you will have heard me talk about the Hewlett-Packard LaserJet firmware team. In 2008, this team, 400 people distributed across three different countries, had this problem. Uh, and who was here for the keynote where I talked about this? OK, a few of you. So I'll keep it brief. Um, the HP LaserJet firmware people in 2008 had this problem where they were spending all this time on non-value add activity. And they were only able to spend 5% of their time actually building features for customers. And as a result of this, they decided to completely redesign their software so they could work on trunk. Um, they independently reinvented continuous delivery. So they came up with continuous delivery of, you know, just by working out how to achieve better goals. Um, and they actually achieved a, a massive change in the economics of their development process. They massively reduced... Um, the amount of time they were spent on planning activities, on porting code, on product support, uh, you know, quality went up. Um, and they were able to massively increase the amount of time they spent actually delivering value to their customers. Um, these are the economic numbers. So what I realized when I read this book, and I read in, uh, the Toyota Kata, is that the way they had achieved this was by following the improvement Kata. They independently reinvented the improvement Kata as well. So this is a team that independently reinvented both continuous delivery and the improvement cutter, uh, which is pretty, pretty astonishing. Their, their direction that they wanted to achieve was they wanted a 10 times productivity increase. They had no idea how they were going to do it, but that was their goal. They wanted a 10 times productivity increase. And actually, if you look at the numbers three years on, what they achieved uh, was, in fact, uh, an eight times productivity increase. So they went from 5% of time spent on value-added activity to 40% of time spent on value-added activity. So, I mean, eight times is not 10 times, but it's still pretty good. And the way they did it is the leadership did not know how they were going to change their process in order to be able to do this. Instead, what they did is they followed the improvement kata. Every month on the sprint boundaries, they would not just look at the features they wanted to develop over the next month, they would also think about process improvement and how they wanted to improve the process over the course of the next month. And if you actually look at the book, it's a really good book, really worth running, uh, really well worth reading. This is actually a table of their sample mini milestone objectives. So they called their sprints mini milestones because you know, they independently re reinvented all the agile practices they wanted to use. Um, but here's a list of their mini milestone objectives. They wanted a quality threshold where priority one issues were open for less than a week. Level two test failures were fixed within 24 hours. Um, their, their rank one priority outcome was a quarterly bit release with final P1 change requests fixed. And when you look at this, these are nothing other than target outcomes, as the improvement kata specifies. And what would happen is that people within the, the various teams would get together and work out what the highest priority objectives were. And then, you know, they didn't specify 
the methodology that the teams should use. I mean, this is 400 people split into a number of small teams. You know, the standard approach to adopting Agile within large organizations is to take the teams and teach the teams Scrum or something like that. And then we put structures over the top. This is exactly not what they did at HP. They did not tell the teams what process to follow. The teams could follow Scrum or Kanban or Waterfall, whatever they wanted. It didn't matter. They didn't care whether they did stand-ups or had burn-up charts or any of this other stuff. It didn't matter. All that mattered is, as a program, as a division as a whole, were we able to achieve our objectives at the end of the sprint? How you do that doesn't matter. It's not important. And it will change over time because we're constantly going to be evolving our processes and practices in order to be able to better achieve the goals. I think, you know, the, the fabulous thing about the HP uh, case study is that they wrote it up in a book and it exactly fits with what the improvement cast would be. So this is, you know, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to make one further point, which is that this is not just about improving your process. This is fundamentally about growing your people. Because by following this process, what the leaders are doing is helping the workers to learn how to solve their own problems. And if you have an organization where everyone is aligned on the direction they want to move in, and the job of the leadership and management is to create a model which supports the people doing the work, working out how to solve their problems and how to improve processes all the time, continually, and never stop. That's how you build a learning organization. Maybe we'll take one or two questions. Just one question. For yep. There's always a business ROI investment. Yep. 2008 to 2011. How much uh, uh, initial thoughts and planning happened on the investment needed and what is ROI? Because it's a huge investment. Yeah, it, it was a huge investment. But ultimately, what they did is, I mean, you're spending the same amount of money over here as you're spending here. So the overall investment doesn't change. What changes is what you're spending the money on. On the left here, we're spending 95% of our investment on non-value-add activities, like detailed planning, like porting code between branches. This is where your money's going. And in most organizations, this is invisible, because most organizations don't actually divide up their costs by activity. This is called activity-based planning. Most organizations look at their costs in terms of, oh, we're paying for 50 testers and 40 developers and 20 analysts, and we need to cut costs, so maybe we don't need as many analysts, or maybe we should outsource the testing, or maybe we should fire some people, right? That's because we have this cost-based mindset in financial management and financial planning. That's how we think. We don't think in terms of what are those, it doesn't matter what the, you know, how many developers and testers we have. What matters is what are those people actually doing and how much of the stuff they're doing is actually value added. So the investment might not necessarily change, but what changed is everything else. I mean, they changed uh, you know, the, the system's architecture. They implemented completely different processes and practices. They invested in test automation. They massively reduced the amount of time spent on upfront planning. Um, but the overall investment in the team actually didn't change at all. It's just that they became much more effective at what they were doing. You know, instead of spending all this time, I mean, your main cost in technology is people. That's your main cost, right? That's your main lever is, you know, staff costs. And so you've got to start asking the right questions. What are the people actually doing? Where's the non-value-add activity? How can we change our investments and change other stuff in order to improve that? And, and you know, the problem is most people's response to that is fire people, outsource stuff, buy tools, adopt a methodology. None of those things are effective. That's why it doesn't work, and that's why people fail at implementing Agile. I'm going to be around in the ThoughtWorks booth outside. Um, my contact details are here. Please feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much for coming today.